Good afternoon, everyone. And can you all hear me? Is that clear? Yeah. Excellent. Love it. Um, welcome to Federation Hall. If you haven't met me, I'm David Squera, and I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery across the road. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker, Sean Lynch, I want to take a moment and invite you all to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the VCA was established or the University of Melbourne was even thought of, that the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation practiced song and dance. They made paintings, sculptures, shared stories on this land. And it's really with joy and honor um, that I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. So our guest speaker, Sean Lynch. Based in Askerton, County Limerick, Ireland, Sean Lynch has a multimedia practice that positions him somewhere between artist and storyteller revealing unwritten stories, forgotten histories, extracting alternative readings of place, events and artifacts through his works, he refers to a contemporary form of the Irish bardic tradition of poetry. Sean's major public art project, Distant Things Appears Suddenly Near, commissioned by the city of Melbourne, combines architectural reconstruction, elements from the city's history of public art and a wide variety of found objects that reference urban Melbourne. Please make Sean very, very welcome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, David. Uh, super. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk today. Um, I'm very excited to be in Melbourne. I got here on Monday evening. I've been working on a project for the last four years a uh, public art commission for the city here that launched in December time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, what I thought was uh, um, a good thing to do was to speak about a couple of, of other projects of mine that are maybe relevant or important around some of the methodologies, uh, thoughts and working practices that have been made manifest with the commission here in University Square. Um, and if you're still interested after that, I'm going to do a talk down at the sculpture on Sunday afternoon, which you're all welcome to as well. All right. Uh, so I get straight into it. The fellow that you see here up on the screen, his name is Eddie Lenehan. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch children's television. Eddie had a program called 10 Minute Tales, uh, where it would be Eddie on TV telling stories that he had collected in his work as a Shanachi or story collector in Ireland from about the 1970s onwards. And Eddie would go around with a tape recorder, uh, uh, had a group of informants, as he would call them, uh, and he'd record stories that they had. Uh, some of these stories would be very, very coherent. They'd have a beginning, an interesting middle and a poignant end. Uh, what Eddie would find is that if you kept asking the one person for stories day after day, they'd run out of a repertoire. And then the pieces of information, the kind of narratives that we live in our lives, which can't be synthesized into uh, an interesting beginning, an exciting middle, and a concise end would come to the fore. Fragments or memories that in somehow wouldn't fit into the archetypical forms of storytelling that we know today. Uh, so the next slide there, please. Uh, and through this practice and being on TV and telling kids pretty scary stories that he had heard, you know, his television program lasted two seasons. Uh, he came by, uh, uh, you can see an image of a, of a white thorn bush up in the top left hand image there. Um, this is a fairy bush. This is where the fairies of Ireland would meet uh, before they would go into battle against the fairies in the next region. Uh, Irish fairies are not, uh, they don't have pretty wings or they're not disnified. They're about five foot tall. Funnily enough, they have green blood, uh, very belligerent characters. Uh, generally, you would avoid them. They have an underground system, the same as what Melbourne now desires, for example. Um, they have fairy bushes that they meet beside, and they have fairy paths as well. And many of the stories that Eddie collected come out of an interest in fairy lore. Um, someone who doesn't believe in fairies, for example, might say that 
uh, fairies came about through um, a colonial existence of Ireland, where there were gaps in knowledge. Uh, if the crops failed uh, that particular year because of the policies of the Crown towards agricultural reform in the country, uh, the Crown weren't blamed, instead it was the fairies. Uh, someone got sick and their mind had uh, disappeared. That was the fairies taking someone's head, you know. Um, so if he intervened in a situation here where you can see the construction of a 30 million euro motorway, which was going to steamroll over this particular fairy bush. Uh, he claimed that if the motorway was built and the fairy bush was demolished, the fairies would take revenge on the motorists on the road. Um, he got onto CNN, into the New York Times as well. And by using these forms of media that he was very familiar with through working in TV, he managed to get the motorway rerouted around the bush. Um, and for me, it's a very important thing that he managed to do, taking a belief system from one time and place and recontextualizing it against the cogs of capitalist growth that we all somehow conform in and out of today. And for me, he's a hero, of course, okay? Um, so this is a video I made with him that has get, got shown a lot in the last 15 years where he's beside the fairy bush. There's, of course, a very nice visual pun between Eddie's quite large beard and bush in the background there. Um, I personally think he's already somehow holistically known those connections. Um, and he's a great storyteller. So when I present this in galleries, I'll show you the next slide. Um, it's typically presented with detritus from the motorway that is now close to the ferry bush, which still exists on the site there. Uh, I can excitedly tell you a few things about this, I suppose some sort of form of archeology span I'm involved in, in the next slide. Uh, that's what a burnt out tire looks like from an Irish motorway. And you can see the majority of drink cans that are thrown out of the windows of speeding motorists in Ireland in that particular region are Coke, Coca-Cola. Uh, some occasional cider bottles and uh, beer as well. So I hope you can kind of get a sense I'm interested in micro narratives or stories that exist somehow in a fragmentary way that um, by knowing them and telling them and trying to spread them around the place that they become part of a different sense of, of thinking about places, about history and how we contextualize ourselves within that. Um, I'm still firm friends with Eddie and we want to keep making videos together. We've made some books as well. So a lot of making these projects for me are about friendship and having a cohort of people over a period of time that this form of research gets spread out. You know, I don't become the authority with it. I don't become the person who knows the most about the fairy bushes. Can you imagine that? Being an expert on fairy bushes, okay? So instead it's about chains of handling and how information and narratives move around the place. And they're quite typical strategies in many ways around say conceptual art practice and that notion that art is handle information. So when I was a student, these were important ideas for me. Um, let's have a look at the next slide. So great, and it's a video, yeah. Uh, so whenever you wanna play it, with the, I can talk over. Um, so I'm gonna show a video that was made in 2007. Uh, it involved uh, peregrine falcons Peregrine falcons are the fastest uh, creatures on the planet. They can go faster than a Formula One motor car. Um, and I attached a camera onto the head of the peregrine falcon, two peregrine falcons, and then they were rewilded into uh, a housing project in the north part of Limerick City. And at that time, uh, there was, had been so much terrible violence in the area. Um, the, My Ross is the name of the district uh, that the, the, um, will it play? Uh, I keep talking anyway. Um, so so uh, 
the, the neighborhood in, in Limerick had the president of Ireland came down and said, we're going to knock the entire neighborhood and turn it into something that's typically more suburban. So a lot of people were very annoyed about that fact uh, because they bought their houses outright from the council. And now you had the central authority of the country saying, we're going to knock your house. Um, so it was very difficult to find forms of representation to deal with this situation. There was a very journal, it's not going to play, no? Okay. Well, I can tell you a little bit about it. Which is in, okay. Uh, that's the power of being faulted. So they were introduced into that particular neighborhood um, and they made an aerial or bird's eye view um, flying through the housing estate. Um, and then the footage that was derived from that was then distributed throughout the neighborhood. Um, and I suppose this was a strategy not of mine. It was one that had began in folklore and storytelling well before this time in um, the story of Sweeney. Uh, Sweeney was a pagan king in Ireland uh, before Christianity came there. He had the run of the place. Next thing, all the Christian, Christian bishops came along. Um, he had arguments with them. They remembered some of their old pagan tricks and they cursed Sweeney to be half man, half bird. Uh, Seamus Heaney has written uh, a very long poem about this. And Sweeney travels throughout Ireland, half man, half bird, never accepted by the men of Ireland because he's half a bird. The birds don't trust him because he's half man. Uh, so he's a, a castaway uh, and he appears in different places, perches for a while, gives a lamenter poem about the situation he's seen as a new hierarchy comes into the country and changes things around and leaves again. And it was a great topic for a lot of, uh, a lot of artists in Ireland in the 1980s, for example, with the neo-expressionist turn. Uh, how do you paint half man, half bird? You know, what part has the feathers? Where's the beak? All that sort of stuff. Um, and it became a very important thing in my practice at the time, thinking about this modality, you know, about how representational modes can it somehow perch in different situations for a while and find ways of trying to find uh, a way of explaining or talking through that. So we we'll skip the video. Maybe I, we can I'll put it online another time, and we can share it through some of the media at the college. And on the next slide, I can give you an example of thinking a little bit like Sweeney. This is a called the DeLorean motor car. Uh, the DeLorean was uh, here, it's in a film called Back to the Future, uh, a very popular 1980s blockbuster with Michael J. Fox in it. Uh, the car here has been remade into a time machine. There was three of the films, they're quite popular and well known, I think. And the car uh, reached a kind of iconic status at that time as this gull winged car that people were interested in the shape. and many of the stories related to it. It was manufactured in Belfast uh, between 1980 and 1982. Uh, the man who oversaw the operations of it was a guy called John DeLorean. He was a maverick entrepreneur. He traveled all through the world getting money to open his factory in Belfast, a town that had little tradition in car manufacturing. He trained up 3,000 workers to make a car from scratch both Protestants and Catholics who would fight outside the factory never would fight inside in the factory because they were so passionate about making cars. Okay? So that's the narrative that's told. Um, and I'm very interested in situations where we all know that kind of archetypical narrative of a factory being built, right? Uh, foreign investment involved in it, training up the workers, um, new towns, people's lives. But there's very little uh, about what happens when things start going wrong with manufacturing and how to find the stories that might be poignant or relevant to dwell on in those situations. So you can see in the next slide, uh, DeLorean uh, uh, fell out with Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher stopped giving government funds to the factory in Belfast. 
uh, on the 25th of October 1982, DeLorean was found in Suite 504 of the Sheridan Lorena Hotel near LAX Airport in Los Angeles, uh, trying to buy $20, 000, $20 million worth of cocaine. Uh, it was an FBI entrapment. His idea was with the proceeds from the cocaine, he would be able to pay the factory workers wages in Belfast. Right? Uh, the next day, the factory closed in Belfast. I suppose this is the economy of the world. The cocaine bust goes wrong in Los Angeles. The factory closes in Belfast. And a procedure began to remove a lot of the objects, uh, commodities, and items from the production reign of the factory. Um, so 25 years later, I worked through some of the sites. I'd bring a camera along. I uh, go to, for example, where the factory is in Belfast on the left hand side. Then this is one of numerous scrap yards I visited. Um, and I asked the men working in the scrap yard if they remember any of the DeLorean material that would have passed through the gate 25 years ago. Uh, now you can imagine there's a volume of scrap moves through any of these places. And everybody remembered the DeLorean material because it was a big story at the time plus the pieces of metal that they handled, which were the stamps for beating out the, those unusual shapes you saw in the time machine, they were very, very heavy. So I continued asking questions because I was really interested in that notion of day-to-day -day work and the information and the stories that get amassed through that and how in some ways, certainly at that time, there wasn't necessarily an outlet for the orality of that material. Um, and where that got me is the next slide. So these are the DeLorean um, machinery. Uh, I located them at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean um, in uh, summertime. Uh, so th th these shapes that you see here that are covered by what we would call coral in Ireland, but it's on seaweed, of course, you know, um, co co covered with Irish coral. Uh, would, it, would have been used to, to stamp out those shapes, okay? And nowadays, there's a lobster living in those uh, molding uh, crevasses. Um, and of course, I wanted to be an imperialist at the time. I wanted to rent a barge, go and be a hero and pull up these pieces of uh, tooling and make one last car out of it, you know? It's the sort of thing an artist would do, you know? Uh, and then I realized after coming by the lobster that that would be a very clear form of imperialism towards his house. He lives there. He's actually, the size of him is dictated by that crevasse. Um, so uh, again, it should be about keeping it light, you know, and the narratives and the story and the joy to come here and tell you about it rather than starting up industrial processes again. You know, uh, you can see some more of the images here. It's another one. So you can see this lad, it does look like he's in the passenger seat, no? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was incredibly lucky to, to find the right weather conditions and circumstance. And there was a lot of time passed in a lot of local people to know the exact location of this material. And one last slide to share. Uh, so funnily enough, the, the swimming crab looks a little bit like a DeLorean car with the, with the doors open. Um, and some friends of mine always uh, criticize the photograph when they see it saying, Sean, why didn't you get rid of the red eye? <laughs> okay. um, and just one last slide about the project. So you can see how it's installed in a gallery situation. These photographs within this ramshackle attempt of mine to try and make a DeLorean car just uh, out of handmade means. And my friend Neil McKenzie and I worked on this over a year and it would be presented in gallery contexts as um, never working out somehow, you know? But I was always interested, and look, you're in an art college, so you should be thinking about this, the, the fatal relationship between labor and product, okay? And um, if you just uh, remove the notion of ever having to make a product, somehow labor becomes something so wild you know, and how to use it and how the situations that can be dispensed in and the friendships you can make with working with other people when you don't have to think about a product at the end. 
So that's my little art kind of spiel for today. <laughs> um, for the next slide, uh, so I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of a sense of um, some of the working process that I've been involved uh, here in the last uh, four years. Um, and uh, I got an invite from the city in 20, late 2018 uh, to develop some kind of public intervention or art commission on a temporary basis on a location that some of you might know in University Square, so very close to another part of the university campus, uh, a little bit north of the city centre. And uh, it was a, an open brief. So instead of having to come up with a proposal and propose something, even though I was not very familiar with Melbourne, I was given an opportunity to come here and work within uh, the urban context of the city and some of the circumstance of uh, what the city of Melbourne uh, has been like and aspires to, and then develop an artwork through that. And so the title of the piece is Distant Things Appear Suddenly Near. And uh, I only got to see it on Tuesday for the first time, uh, which is very exciting. And it was a remote process over the COVID times uh, uh, to work with the public art team here to realize it. And um, I'm still learning how to speak about it, okay? Um, because uh, as much as I understand some elements and certain working processes, uh, it still very much feels like it's something that's alive, that um, I'm not talking about as a past project. So I'll just give you how I feel about it today <laughs> and some of the things that I can tell you. And uh, I hope you appreciate them and that they're useful uh, as an introductory way around it. So here's an image uh, of um, a, a timber structure uh, that refers to uh, an incident that happened in 2016 about 100 and maybe 150 meters away from where you, you see this sculpture. And there was a Victorian pub called the Corkman, which was demolished over one weekend by, I don't know the term here is cowboy building developers or rogue building developers who uh, wanted to get rid of the Victorian structure and put up a 13 story uh, apartment with some hotel complex type thing in its location. So um, already this narrative is one that's told throughout the world, okay? Um, and uh, uh, a rapid sense of gentrification in my mind, moving from the center of the city here up in a northward direction. And uh, so I thought, okay, would it be interesting for um, an apparition to occur close to where this, this happened, because the story is still in the media a lot, like the, some government ministers have been talking about it, that it's an example of um, ways of uh, getting away with heritage law and all this kind of thing here. And at the same time, uh, uh, I don't want to rebuild the structure, you know? It's not like a heritage park I'm trying to do here. So, this is about three quarters the size of the original bar. Uh, as you can see, it's just the facade. Um, it's certainly not finished in the way that it looks like um, it's in a theme park on the edge of the city or something. It's quite rough plywood. And it's related somehow to the fact that right behind it here, there's a building site and there's the construction of a new metro station. Um, Park built metro station, which is going to serve some of the university campus up there. And so I like this notion of an intermediary space where it was possible to start using this area as uh, a place maybe that there could be improvised situations. Buildings that were not four or five years ago suddenly start appearing in uh, some form or other as a ghost, you know? Um, and then gradually after also continuing other lines of research, things started building up that other objects 
would become magnetized and would move into this particular notepad. Um, and I'll show you a few more of them. Uh, so behind the structure, there's the, these elm trees, uh, trunks of elm trees. And these were originally placed in the park uh, in the late 1800s. And uh, the pattern that they were planted in uh, when you would look from above down at the park was in the shape of the Union Jack flag. Uh, so they were literally used as a colonial stamp onto this particular area, which pre-Western um, civilization appearing here uh, would have been a tributary area for the river Yara. Um, and somehow th these were kept in storage after they were taken away in the park's redevelopment in the last couple of years. And I was interested that they could in some way become free again that in, in some sense, they no longer had an agenda to tell of colonialism, that they in some way were not used as an agent of that. And so they appear here in some way holding up some of the structures in the background. Uh, we didn't treat them in any way. We just pulled them out of the storage depot and landed them down there. My friend Liz will tell you many very, very funny stories about how heavy these trees are. Uh, and then, you start moving around the area, which seems like a little bit like a storage area in some sense, or has a certain kind of aesthetic maybe related to a scrapyard or an archaeological site or a kind of maybe a de Chirico painting. These were kind of all incidental things that happened out of working with the material and seeing how one thing would move beside, against, for, and with each other. And one notion I've had is that because the piece is in, in situ for two years, uh, I really like the idea that it's a little bit like house share. So you've got all these different objects that are like renting a room in the house, okay? And some people get on better with other people. Everybody's got to share the kitchen. Uh, there's the politics of living with, with strangers and new friends and all that sort of stuff. So. Somehow this is the convergence is a little bit like that for a period of two years there. That's been a very useful analogy for me to think through. Can I show you another couple of images? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, and the previous one. Yeah, so I hope that gives you a sense of the one thing putting up against each other. And one of the questions that people uh, were asking me, because I've had to do a good bit of online talks about the structure and things once we had the launch in December time, people were going, you know, what's it like being in Ireland and then making uh, um, a, a sculpture in Australia? And it's a very um, alienated situation, you know, because you're just on a computer um, and there's no sense of physical relationship between you and the piece. And I think one of the important things or useful things maybe about being an artist is you end up developing your own toolbox uh, over the years to deal with situations, you know? Somebody might tell you something that seems very incidental in a, in a or in dinner or in a conversation or whatever the case is, and you start realizing little comments add up to your belief system, you know? The same way as those fragments with Eddie uh, Lenehan and the fairy bush and the motorway, incidental encounters, uh, little rumors, memories that you've had and you try to hold on to it, but you keep forgetting them or they change into something else. All those things build up into your belief system and the way you deal with the world. Okay. Um, so anytime people were asking me about, okay, how, what, how do you deal with that alienation? Well, it's very simple. That sculpture is touching the ground here. Uh, the ground of Australia is touching the ocean. The ocean is touching Ireland. And I'm sitting here at the computer screen touching Ireland. So I'm actually touching this sculpture here right now. Uh, Merleau Ponty calls this the flesh of the world. And he says our realities in some way are cut out of this, okay? Uh, the great Irish writer Flann O'Brien wrote a book about this phenomenon. 
uh, called a third policeman. And it means there's no borders, there's no divisions, uh, anything that you touch becomes part of you, okay? And that seems like quite egalitarian way to be getting on with the business of trying to figure out who you are and what you're doing. And it's also about corrupting your identity in some sense, because every time you come by something, it becomes part of you. So you never have a stable identity. It's always about the encounters you have, the situations that you come by, that both you contribute to and affect you. And I think they're important things. That's my toolbox, I suppose, for trying to get by in the world. I'm going to show one more slide. That's the outside of the court then, and then the last slide. So around that idea, one of the reasons, I suppose, that we're all interested in making art is to find people and kinships and relationships that uh, mean something to you. And uh, when I was working on this piece, I came by in storage um, a piece by the Adelaide artist Hossein Balamanish um, that was uh, realized uh, quite close to here on the South Bank in the late 1990s. And the work was called Fault Line. And uh, the more I started researching about it, I thought it was very interesting artwork. And I uh, got in touch with Hussein, who didn't know who I was or wouldn't have known my practice necessarily. We work in different communities, I suppose, in different parts of the world. And then over time, we developed a relationship that meant that Hussein's work has reappeared from being removed uh, from the South Bank in the early 2000s, was put in storage, and now is realized here as a figure, a cast of his own body, uh, an oar, and the boat that you see with a, a submerged pier. And uh, Hussein passed away very suddenly in January. So um, for me, this was a very important thing about, you know, the stuff is really not about making the objects, but it's about understanding your situations in the world and finding kinships. Um, and so this was a very important relationship that occurred for me. And just want to share that with you. So you can go down and see the piece at your own leisure. It's on 24 hours of the day, I believe. <laughs> uh, it looks a little bit different at night time. Uh, with the images you see here, you're not getting the sound of the Metro works being bashed out in the background. Uh, so I was always interested in that context of making something that looks a little bit like a building site right beside a building site. Uh, and there's, I hope, a sense of it being a transitory space and that that might be a valuable thing uh, to think about in relationship to the city, which seems to be instead about uh, solidifying scenarios all the time, um, big skyscrapers and all that sort of stuff that as artists, we can at least contribute to counterpoints or counter environments to challenge those pervasive elements of capitalism, the coiled circuit of capitalism. So I'll leave you with all that. I hope some of it was useful. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm really happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for such a generous talk and um, really congratulations on this work. And, you know, we're, uh, the, thing, the thing I want to leave you with is that we, uh, you know, on behalf of everyone, really appreciate um, the rawness of this work because, as you said, it's the first time you, you only saw this work after a long period um, of it incubating. You only saw this work for the first time just last week. So... We so appreciate um, that vulnerability and that rawness and sharing that with us today. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw it open to people for questions. And I, there is one thing I forgot to do, and that is to welcome everybody in Zoom land. So if you are in Zoom land, apologies for forgetting you uh, when I opened this, this talk. So hello. And um, if you have a question in Zoom land, you can send that to Jen through the Q&A facility. But if you're in Federation Hall, if you could just raise your hand and... We can take questions that way. Yeah, please, Sonia. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Sonia. I haven't really fully formed the question, but it's about um, the comment you made about this light touch with um, the art work and, um, yeah, and the reciprocity of it to kind of um, you know, get the color out of the ocean. And um, I had the story 
and I'm just sort of thinking this, um, you know, the internet and digital media, like how the materialized the work that art objects, but that how necessary it is in time, both to probably just tell the stories, um, to, yeah, like a non-material way. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's something I'd be, I don't have a clear uh, answer for it or a manifesto, but I, I think about that a lot. Um, I'm still a believer in um, touch, you know, a, a, a analogy I gave you about the flesh of the world. Um, still think there's a lot of physicality in the world. And somehow I feel like I don't want to abandon that and move all the material into digital encounters necessarily. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, I used to be one of these artists that when somebody would say, do you want to put your video artwork up online? I'd freak out for a week, <laughs> you know? Uh, but the last two or three years have taught me different than that, like, you know? And, you know, when I went, to college in the 90s the first text that everybody got in the art theory class was walter benjamin and the destruction of the aura and like how how that should be in the 1990s so already that's that's changed so much you know and in some sense i've always been interested in artisanal practices which maybe is not coming so much in the talk but you can see people like Eddie who put in the time and energy in collecting stories or again working to make manifest certain parts of that car and learn about the shaping of metal towards that means. Um, and uh, so there's something there that still drives an investigation for me that I'd like to find out more about. Um, and so that drives an interest in objecthood. I guess in the artworks. I made a show in 2019 in Leeds in the Henry Moore Institute. And uh, there the exhibition was about um, a character called Flint Jack. And he was in Victorian Britain. He was a vagabond. He would arrive into different museums that were beginning to form themselves and have collections in the 1840s and 1850s and he would say to the guys in the museum listen I was just outside the town there and I was having a drink of water in the river and I just lifted up my head and I saw all these arrowheads there and I picked them up and people in the town say you're the guys that are interested in the old stuff so do you want to buy the arrowheads and this Roman pot I have as well and uh, enthusiastically uh museums would purchase these okay uh flint jack was a forger he was making all this stuff himself uh and then he'd arrive in and he'd sell it off you know and um over uh, decades of this activity he put forgeries in all the museums up and down the brick and like in the british museum for example they have a whole pile of flint jacks uh his reputation spread curators would have a photograph of him so in case he called to your door, you could go, oh, geez, that Flint Jack, okay? <laughs> and uh, nobody knows where he died, how he died, or where he's buried, okay? Um, in the museums, they keep all these artifacts because uh, they have an element of social history towards the collection, but the insurance value on all of them is, is like 10 pounds. All right. <laughs> and uh, the idea of the exhibition I made was his second retrospective. He had a retrospective in 1854 in the York Museum, where the curator got together a collection of Flint Jack artifacts to warn the public what they looked like. <laughs> so that uh, instead of an exhibition as celebration, it was an exhibition as a warning sign. Um, and so I thought that maybe this is a character who should have a retrospective in the world we live in now, right? And so some of the museums cooperated and there was about 60 works in the show. Um, so that maybe is an example about thinking about objects and temporality, you know? Um, things can happen long ago or into the future or different situations or times that have a latency 
for now, okay? But at the time that they're made, maybe the social conditions are not in place for people to completely understand what artists are doing, you know? So it's always a speculative thing. And I'm always interested in those time lags and scenarios like that, that what a bag of bond was doing in the 1850s really only comes to bear now because we're thinking about situations of materiality in a similar way. Yeah, please, Simone. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to break the light and have you um, run through the fact that I also did this concept that you talked about of touching in a physical way. But what I wanted to ask about was place, the role of place, because I know that's been important in this work and the physics that we've seen this develop, but also the role of archaeology and these incidental narratives in maybe another kind of alternative narrative of what place. Just before you answer that question, I realised that the people in Zoom land didn't hear the question. So I'm just going to say it for the people in Zoom and Simone, just correct me if I haven't said it. Um, so the question came from Simone and it's for Sean and it's asking, the question is to comment about the, about the role of place. Is that right, Simone? Do you want to come out and say it into the microphone? Thank you. I'm so sorry. I should have... I'm on stage with you at last. Hey, at last, we've been waiting for so long. Um, thanks so much, Sean, and for those in Zoom. Like, actually, now I've said my question, I'm going to reframe it. Um, what's the role of archaeology and objects and narrative in the construction of a, of a place? Because place seems to be important and a counter narrative in place. Okay. Super. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I suppose to start off the answer. When I uh, started working um, in an earnest way as an artist uh, at home in Ireland, they'd, you know, I'd try to get commissions or gigs and stuff. And then there'd be these uh, call outs for pieces of public art in towns. So they'd be getting an artist in to get to the town and find uh, like a diamond hunter, go and find the most special thing about that particular town, shine it up as much as you can and put it in the main square, you know? Uh, so it was like about essence, you know, and getting to the essence of things. Um, and I'm kind of battled hardened enough at this stage to know that's only one element of placemaking. Of course, there's special things about the places we live in and all that sort of stuff. I'm not denying that, but there's also frameworks and algorithms and all this sort of stuff that, um, is about uniformity and instrumentalization. Um, and they're the things that need to be kind of overcome or challenged or for, to find counterpoints in those scenarios, you know? Um, so for example, the piece here um, is not necessarily about the essence of Melbourne, okay? I'm not trying to make a special flavor of Melbourne, okay? Um, if the research had gone other ways, if a telephone conversation happened in a different sense, if another particular research strand um, was enabled in another way or there was circumstance, this artwork would be different, okay? So that's improvised, you know? Um, it's not uh, trying to say that's the only version that that piece could come up with. So I guess my role, or like I worked a lot with Liz and my friend John as well on the work, um, was to put a framework in place uh, for something like this to occur, uh, to be able to critique our own decisions around it as well, even though it's being presented publicly. Um, so was it the right thing to do the Corkman in that way? Who knows, you know? But it's about that role of having the opportunity of doing things in a very public sense, uh, seeing what that is, and, and sharing it with people as much as possible because momentum is the thing that makes places, you know? If you're doing nothing, then nobody really knows it's a place anymore, you know? So, and a, a bit about archeology. span um, um, There's still a lot of places to dig. <laughs> yeah. And um, maybe that's not necessarily a good thing or Maybe it's a bad thing. I, I'm unsure about about it, um, but um, it might not always be a case of doing that now. You know, sometimes investigations can happen where it takes a long chain of handling to find something like that DeLorean project.
but I'm always a believer that also when somebody tells you something, should you really dig around to know if that's the truth or not? You know, um, so there's something valuable about not knowing the uh, the one truth or the single explanation where an empirical act like archaeology suggests that in many cases. Um, Goethe uh, said that, um, maybe this is a useful thing to say, Goethe said that um, the, the, uh, about the sound of truth, he said, uh, it's like the church bells. Uh, they sound nice from the distance, but you don't want to get too close to them. All right. Um, thank you so much, Sean, for taking us through um, elements of your practice, for really taking us through the, the work in Melbourne. Uh, for people, um, people should know that Sean is doing a public tour of um, this particular work of art at 3 p.m. on Sunday. You can find out more about that through the City of Melbourne website. Um, and I think there's nothing else for me to say except to thank our audience, both in Zoom land and here in Federation Hall. Please join me in thanking our guest speaker, Sean Lynch. Thank you. And we'll see you all back here next Thursday for Art Forum. Thanks. Oh, thanks, David, so much. Pleasure.